No, I'm not building a race car, but yes, I did buy a custom steering wheel on eBay. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. A couple of years ago, I made a video about putting a speed handle on the quill of my PM935 mill. It's definitely an improvement over the stock handle, but I still hate it. It's never in the position I need, and I cannot tell you how many times I've hit the camera trying to adjust it. So today, we're gonna to do something different. If you're not familiar with a speed handle, it's just a quill handle that you can buy as a replacement for nearly any mill, and it's spring-loaded, so you just pull out the handle and move it to a new position so that you can get the handle in the position you need for any particular operation. The downside is it's always in the wrong position, and while adjusting it, I seem to always find a way to hit the camera, which I know is a me problem, not a you problem, but I'm getting tired of this thing. I want something better. So like many YouTubers who came before me, I bought a steering wheel. This is a custom aluminum steering wheel that I found on eBay that I really like the look of, and we're gonna remove this handle and fit the steering wheel to the mill in its place. The speed handle is just held on with a single set screw in a groove, loosen that, and it just pops right off the hub. You can see how this thing works. Pulling the handle pulls back a couple of spring-loaded pins that fit into holes in the hub. To actually mount the steering wheel, we have a couple of different options. We could build an adapter that fits over the hub, just like the speed handle does, with pins that fit into the holes in the hub. Or we could remove the hub entirely and make an adapter that fits onto the shaft. The hub is just held in with a single socket head cap screw. It's kind of an interesting screw. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then the hub just pulls off. We've just got a shaft with a key. That should be easy enough. Let's measure it up and see what we need. I'm just measuring with calipers here because I expect this to be a nominal size. Yep, it's a 16 millimeter shaft. There's no need to get out of micrometer for that. And the key's probably three millimeters. 2.96, yep, that's a three millimeter key. Let me just stick that back in there so I don't lose it. Now the screw itself is kind of interesting. I expected this to be an M8 screw. It's a metric shaft. Got my thread checker here, but this screw will not screw into any of the eight millimeter holes, M8 by one, M8 by one and a quarter, it doesn't fit. However, I've got an Imperial thread checker and this is a 5 16 18. So we've got a 5 16 18 thread screw in a 16 millimeter shaft with a three millimeter key, but it gets weirder. This thing also has a six millimeter hex socket in it. I would have expected it to be quarter inch for 5 16 18 but the quarter inch wrench does not fit. So we've got a metric socket in an imperial screw going into a metric shaft. I don't know. I, I, I always wonder how things like this happen, but I have no idea. If anyone knows, throw that down in the comments. I'd be very curious. In any case though, we know what we need to build. So let's go into the computer and draw something up. I already happened to have a model of the hub for the PM935 mill, and I made this when I did the original video about fitting the speed handle because I thought I was gonna have to CNC mill a replacement for it. The hole placement on the original hub wasn't quite exactly right, so I was having a little bit of trouble with the pins fitting in some positions. I was gonna make a new one. I ended up just modifying the one I had, but I still have the 3D model. So this has a lot of the geometry I need already constructed. It has the 16 millimeter board, it has the three millimeter keyway. I know the shoulder length out here to the flange, so I know how much space I need to fit back inside the head. I know the shoulder length to where the screw will bear on it, and I know the outside diameter of this flange section. That's important because there are some screw heads that that has to clear. So given that I already have all this geometry, it was easy to just model an adapter for the steering wheel. So I've got the same shaft and the same shoulder geometry up to this diameter that needs to clear the screw heads. And then beyond that, I added about two inches of spacer and three threaded holes to secure the steering wheel. 
And then of course I've got this shoulder in here at the same depth so we can use the same screw to attach it. Now I think this is right. I just held the steering wheel up next to the machine to kind of see how much clearance I was going to have because we need to clear the gear shift lever. And I wasn't entirely sure. So I think the best thing to do is going to be just to 3D print this thing first. That'll give us a mock-up that we can put on the mill and see if it's going to work before we go to the trouble of machining this out of metal. I'm going to print the test part in carbon fiber nylon on the Chidi XCF Pro printer. And the reason I'm using that combination is not because there's necessarily anything magic about the carbon fiber nylon filament. It's because I have this thing tuned and I know I can hit my dimensions exactly, which means that this bore and keyway will fit the shaft. And it means that these threaded screw holes will accept screws without tapping or doing anything to the part. Now I do have to pick a printing orientation. The obvious way to do it would be the other way up with this large surface down on the bed. The problem is that I would then have support material up inside here where it would be difficult to remove and especially in these threaded holes where it would be difficult to remove. Where if I print it in this orientation, I'll have support material under these shoulders, but that should be really easy to break off. So that's what I'm gonna do. Print this on a raft just to make sure we have plenty of bed adhesion and the bottom surface dimensions will be accurate. And we'll just send this to the printer. This will print overnight and tomorrow. We can go out to the mill and see if it fits. Looks like the print job completed overnight and as usual we don't have a nice plate of spaghetti. That's always good. Honestly, I have no idea how we survived before spring steel bed plates. These things are just magical. The raft always just peels off easily with this stuff, and sometimes the support material comes off easily, but in this case it's adhered on a couple of different levels and it's fit tight around a couple of diameters, so a little bit of prying is required. The trick with a tool like this is to put it through the part and not through your hand. Ask me how I know. Well, that part's not going to win any beauty contest, but we don't need it to win any beauty contest. This is the surface that's going to face in towards the mill. It won't even be visible. Plus, it's also just a test piece. Let's see if it fits. Any bets? You've been around this channel long enough, you know not to take that bet. It's a little bit snug, but it is going on with just hand pressure. It is bottoming. The key clears. It will turn the shaft. So let's go ahead and put the screw in. Make sure we have the right amount of thread engagement. That feels pretty good. Of course, I don't want to tighten it too tight because the plastic is a little bit flexible. Here's the real acid test of your 3D printer. Can you just put in 5 16 screws or 8 millimeter by hand right off a of print without tapping? These fit pretty well. They don't spin freely like a tapped thread, but they go in very easily. Just go ahead and snug down the steering wheel here and see how it works. And that is exactly what I had in mind. It's clearing everything. There is a tiny bit of flex here. If I kind of press it side to side, but that's to be expected. Try the shift handle, and that seems to clear. I can reach in behind it. There's enough room to get a finger between the knob and the wheel. That was the thing I was most worried about is how that was going to clear, and I think this is going to be just fine. And being able to grab this wheel in any position, that is a win. I think all the flexibility I'm feeling here is in the plastic. I guess we'll find out. I was planning to make this part out of steel, but when I went through my scrap bin, this piece of 6061 aluminum is the only thing I found that was of a plausible size. I've got some 1144 that would have worked, but it is quite a bit bigger and it would have turned a lot of money into chips. Now I would like to get this thing running pretty true because this is a small lathe, so I'm gonna use a bearing bump tool here to line it up and see the run out there. And that's just because the cut on the end wasn't square when I clamped it in. And I'll just feed this in until it's running smoothly and it will push the part into alignment with the spindle of the lathe. So with that pushed in there, I'll make sure this is all clamped down. I just did it loosely because I knew I was going to be pushing it around. And that looks really good. 
this tool is just a piece of half inch square stock that I milled out and made room for the bearing. Really simple, really handy. First step as usual is to face off the part just to give us a datum that we can use for all of our other measurements. And then once we have that, I will mark the length that I need to turn down. This will give me visual confirmation even though I'm using the DRO for the measurements. I can see clearly where I need to stop and that'll help keep me from running into the chuck jaws. Having made one light pass, I will take a measurement, put that in my DRO, and then just use the DRO to drive down to the correct diameter. The key to getting aluminum chips to break like this is to take a heavy enough cut. I think I'm taking 50 thou off of the diameter with each pass and 7 thou per revolution feed. Just come down to the shoulder and then back out to clean it up. And then of course we'll put a chamfer on the edge so we don't cut ourselves handling the part. Next thing we need to do is put a hole through this and I always start with a spot drill. And one of the things I've started doing on a small light lathe like this is just feeling the drill as it goes in to make sure that it's not wobbling, to make sure that it's centering properly. Touching it makes it really easy to see what's happening. You can always back out and feed in again to try to kind of scrape it in true if it starts a little bit off center. Now I'll come in here with a relatively small drill push that through to depth, and then come back with a half inch drill, which is the biggest that will fit in this drill chuck, and we'll drill out the bulk of the material. Drill complains a little bit until the center gets fully buried in the part, and then this goes pretty smoothly. Pretty smoothly until that happens. Now at this point, I'm not really even sure what happened, but try as I might, I cannot get the drill back out of the workpiece. By spinning the spindle up just a little bit, it does come free and uh, yeah, we didn't get the whole drill back out of that hole. I would love to be able to tell you that this is the first time I've ever seen a drill fail like this, but it is not. This is in fact the third drill in this set that has failed in a similar way. The other two I was drilling with a drill motor by hand, so I wasn't sure what happened, but this time I'm sure this is a, a, a real failure of the drill material. These are cobalt drills made by Drill Hog, and I bought them because they have a pretty good reputation for quality, but that has not been my experience. Well, like I said, this is the third one in this set that's done something similar. It does look like I have the whole drill. It looks like there were just two pieces, so I don't think there's anything left in the hole. I'll just go ahead and finish this out with a high-speed steel drill. If you've had experiences, good or bad, with the drill hog cobalt drills, go ahead and leave those down in the comments. I'd be really interested to hear what other people are experiencing. I don't really have any other way to tell if maybe I just got some from a bad batch. Hey, as a little aside here during editing, I did actually get the opportunity to put the broken pieces of the drill in an electron microscope and do some element analysis. And it looks like the drill did have a pre-existing crack in it, and it just finally failed with a brittle fracture while I was using it. If you're interested in seeing more of that, let me know, and maybe I can put together a short video. This is the clearance hole side of the part, so this needs to be opened up to 19 millimeters, and I'll just come in here with a high-speed steel boring bar, take multiple passes, and open that up. That's the first pass, took a relatively light one. We'll blow the chips out of the hole, and then come in with a three-point internal mic to see where we are, and then we'll set the DRO based on this, and bore it out to diameter. The diameter here isn't super critical, so we don't have to be real fussy. So the DRO should be fine. Because this is a relatively deep hole and this is a relatively thin boring bar, I'm taking relatively light passes. And then I'm finishing up the last couple of cuts with very light passes, similar to the one I took initially when I took the measurement. So hopefully the tool pressure and deflection will be similar and the DRO will be more accurate. And yeah, we're within about three hundredths of a millimeter. That's fine. 
When I flip the part around in the chuck, I am clamping on a finished surface. So I'm using a piece of aluminum can to protect the part from the jaws. And I'll go ahead and use a dial indicator and tap this in to make sure it's running true. It's really not that important in this application, but this is good practice for another time when it is important. If this were a production job and I were having to make a lot of these and pay for the time of an employee to do it, I probably wouldn't take this step. But I'm a hobbyist and I like to do things well. Now we just need to bring this down. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it down to about the same diameter as the rest of the part, and then face it off to the correct length. With that to length now, we just need to turn down the shoulders. Again, I'll make a mark so I can see where I need to stop, but I'll stop a few thousandths short of that position so that on the last pass, I can back out, clean up the shoulder. And there's a second step on here that's done exactly the same way. Just bring it down in multiple passes and then back out to clean up the shoulder again. And then I'll bring in a chamfer tool and break all of these edges. These don't really need big chamfers, I just don't want them to be sharp. This end of the part is going to get this 16 millimeter precision bore for the shaft. So we'll do this exactly the same way. We'll start by spotting the drill, feeling it so I can tell if it's wobbling at all. The cobalt drill was still sitting here, so I'll give this a shot. I don't expect this to cause any trouble. And then of course use the half inch high speed steel drill to bring it out to the maximum diameter I can drill with this chuck. You can hear that I'm advancing the drill and then stopping momentarily to break the chip. This is just so I don't get a huge rat's nest here. And then we'll bring in the same boring bar and bring it to diameter. Doing exactly the same thing, take a light cut, measure, and then get down close, split the last cut measuring in between so that we can hit the bore precisely where we need it. And let's see how we did. This should be 16 millimeters or slightly over so it can fit on a 16 millimeter shaft. And I will take that any day. Break the edge and all of the lathe work on this part should be done. At least I hope so because I already took it out of the chuck. I need to put three threaded holes in the top of this part to screw on the steering wheel. And to do that, I need to hold it vertically in the mill. I'd like to do that without marring anything up. So I'm gonna use these aluminum V-block jaws that I made for my G0704 CNC mill. They are a little bit shorter, so I'll put quarter inch parallels underneath them to lift them up close to the top of the vice jaws in this mill. Second jaw is just flat, but it is soft, so it'll prevent me from marring up the part. I don't really want the part to sit down on the dust shield there and bear on that in the vise, so I'll throw a thin parallel across the bottom there and clamp this down. And this should come up nice and square just because of the V-groove in that jaw. And then I'll use a dial test indicator on an indicator holder to center the spindle on the part. And I'll just run this around until I get a consistent reading, adjusting the X and Y axes as I go. Since the part's round, the needle should be motionless as I spin it. This just takes a couple minutes. I don't have a coaxial indicator. That would be fun though. Maybe I should get one. Then I'll zero the DRO and set up the bolt hole circle function and we'll put in three holes. We'll start just by spotting because I want to make sure that this is sane and I want to make sure that I have the bolt hole circle set up correctly in the DRO. So I'll just walk around and put in three spots. I'm using A9 as a cutting lubricant here. It works really well on aluminum, so I always keep it in the shop. And with those three spots in, I will grab a scale and make sure this looks sane. Looks right to me, so I'll go ahead and punch those into depth. This is the tap drill for 5 16 18. 
That's the screw that was used in the center of the shaft and that fits the steering wheel well, so I just went ahead and decided to use those to mount the steering wheel to the adapter. This is a pretty short drill for this. I like that because it prevents the drill from wandering, but it does mean that you have to pull the drill all the way out of the hole and brush off the chips periodically to keep the flutes from jamming. We'll also put a generous chamfer on the top of each of these prior to tapping. To actually tap the holes, I'm gonna use a form tap. This doesn't produce any chips, so you don't have to worry about them packing up in the hole. And then I'll use a hook spanner to tighten down the drill chuck, just to make sure it doesn't come loose when I'm backing the tap out of the hole. I'll just lubricate that and push it in. Because the form tap doesn't produce any chips, this usually ends up being a pretty low drama operation. The form tap does require a slightly larger drill size, but tables of drills for form taps are available all over the internet. That should be the last operation on this side of the part but we do need to put a keyway in the other side, so I will flip it over after blowing the chips out. I'm trying to hold that V-block jaw in the same position so that the part will end up centered on the DRO, but I decided ultimately that I didn't trust that and brought in the dial test indicator. It was within a couple thou, which probably would have been fine, but it's better to check than to be sorry. This is the tool I'm going to use to put in the keyway. This is just a half inch boring bar. It's actually patterned off of a Stefan Güttesfinte design. It holds one eighth inch round tool bits, and this is just a piece of drill blank that I ground up on the D-bit grinder many years ago. And I'll use this to slot out the keyway. I actually made this tool for a video that I did several years ago about using my CNC machine to CNC broach keyways. I do want the bottom of the keyway to be square, so I am holding a parallel up against the flat end of the ground tool and rotating the spindle left and right. I have it in low gear to keep it from spinning, and I have the cover off and I'm just turning the pulley by hand to get this lined up. This only affects the bottom of the keyway, so I really don't need this to be too precise, so I'm just looking down the parallel and lining it up with the vice jaws. Lubricate the part up here with some A9, and then I'll bring the tool down and just start feeling for the part. I'm trying to move in until I just barely start to scratch the aluminum. I can feel it and I can hear it. So I'll set my DRO to zero. And then I'll just start moving in, move in about a thousandth of an inch at a time, take a pass and just kind of feel my way in. I want to feed enough that I'm taking a good chip, but not so much that I'm getting a lot of back pressure and thus tool deflection. Having the wheel on here instead of the handle is pretty handy because it's always in the right position. It's taking me a little bit to get coordinated here, but once I get coordinated, I can just move this in pretty quickly. Just get my hand positioned so that I can take a full stroke with my right hand, feed with my left, and once I figure out how to do two different things with two different hands, this goes pretty quickly. This kind of operation is really fun because it's so quiet and it's just magical to watch the chips come off. Now I'm watching the DRO, waiting to get to what I think is the correct depth for the keyway. Then we'll clean it up here and take a measurement. Now I can just measure all the way across the shaft hole to the bottom of the keyway, and so I know that this should be the depth of the keyway plus the diameter of the shaft. It looks like we're not quite there yet. That's probably due to tool deflection or some math mistake that I made. In any case, we'll take it to the depth and then check the width. I did grind the tool just slightly narrower than the key, and sure enough, the key doesn't quite fit. It's really tight and just barely starts, so I'll take a measurement. I just need to take a couple more thou off of each side. So I'll move the tool over a couple thou and I'll take passes backing out of the key, then move over to the left side a couple thou and take some passes feeding back into the bottom. 
And with that done, the key fits beautifully in the keyway. That should be perfect. You can see that did a really beautiful job of cutting a nice sharp keyway. Of course, there's some junk in there. Let me blow that out. And now you can see that did a really nice job of cutting a nice clean keyway. That should work. The 3D printed part actually worked great for all the operations I needed to do today, but long term it probably won't stand up and it's a little more flexible than I prefer, which is why we just spent all this time making an aluminum one. We'll just pull this off. We'll just pull this off. We'll pull this off. Yeah, that's a little bit tight. I will not be defeated. There, piece of cake. The aluminum one looks more or less like the 3D printed plastic one, so let's put it on. Hold the key in so that we don't knock it out. And that's the kind of fit I was looking for. Put the screw in to hold it in place. And we can tighten this one all the way down because we have a metal part now instead of plastic. Yeah, that's much more rigid than the plastic part was. You could probably see in the video if you go back and look that it was flexing a little bit after I installed it. Use the same button head screws and get the steering wheel tightened down on here. And that should be that. And now we can test it, even though technically we already did. The difference in rigidity with the aluminum part is very apparent. Here's a typical operation, peck drilling with one hand and brushing oil on the tool with the other. That's pretty nice and smooth. Though the clock spring kind of binds up sometimes in this mill and it has a little bit of trouble returning to the top. For a long stroke, it works better. These hand-over-hand -hand operations are where the steering wheel really shines over a speed handle. There's still plenty of room to shift gears here. I can easily reach in behind the wheel and the handle clears in every position. So I think this is going to be great. I think I am really going to enjoy having this wheel on the mill. If you enjoyed this video, or even just this super smooth segue, you are in luck because you have all kinds of options to show your appreciation. You can click the thumbs up button, you can subscribe, you can leave a comment, and you can even consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download the drawing and solid model for this and all of my other projects, plus I regularly post lens clips for a little peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.